True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The young woman's long dark hair blows in the breeze. But it's not the cool wind that has caused the goose flesh on her arms or the raised hair on the back of her neck. He's here. She'd felt uneasy about him from the first time she'd laid eyes on him. She thought perhaps that was normal, just nerves. But now, as she sees the expression on his face as he walks toward her, there's no doubt in her mind she's in serious danger. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 100. The murder of Siam Lee. This episode is sponsored by Touchpoint South Africa. If you follow the show on social media, you'll already have seen the amazing giveaway the sponsors doing for True Crime South Africa listeners to help us celebrate the episode 100 milestone. If you haven't yet, I suggest you head over to Facebook or Instagram and check it out. Since I launched the giveaway, the overwhelming response to it has shown me one thing, which I guess I kind of already suspected. A lot of you out there are dealing with insomnia, anxiety, concentration issues, and many other daily mental health challenges. Touchpoints are wearable devices that work by altering the body's stress response with scientifically proven BLAST, bilateral alternating stimulation tactile technology. BLAST uses gentle alternating vibrations on each side of the body to shift your brain from your default fight or flight response to your calm and in control response. Over time, Touchpoints retrains your body, creating new behavior patterns that reduce the negative impacts of stress. Touchpoints are non-invasive and safe for use by adults and children to relieve stress without drugs or side effects. Touchpoint South Africa is giving away four sets of their devices to True Crime South Africa listeners, two Touchpoint Essentials and two Touchpoints for Sleep. There's a wealth of information available on Touchpoint South Africa's website, ilovetouchpointsa.com, and if you don't want to wait for the giveaway or aren't convinced of your luck, you can place an order on their online store. Head over to Facebook and Instagram and enter the competition to stand a chance at winning these incredible devices. Thank you to Touchpoint South Africa for your support of the podcast. Episode 100. 100 cases. Far more than 100 victims. And an incalculable amount of pain. Experienced by thousands of people around both the offenders and the victims. It's quite overwhelming to think about. When I started this podcast in 2019... I had no idea what I was doing. Very often, I still don't feel like I do. But you, True Crime South Africa listeners, have adopted this project of mine, this thing that started as a hobby, and turned it into a bit of an obsession. You got me to episode 100. When I was running around like a headless chicken, or stuck in the depths of a particularly disturbing case. It's been your support, kind words and feedback that's kept me going. So while you're celebrating this milestone, pat yourself on the back too. When I released the first three episodes of this podcast, because those all came out at the same time when I launched, I had absolutely no idea what lay ahead. The adventures, the sadness, the steep learning curve. And most importantly, the amazing connections I would make. It's been these connections, I think, that have been the most valuable part of this journey 
as well as the progress, although small in some instances, that's been made in some of the cases I've covered. None of this would have been possible without you, True Crime South Africa listeners. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Just a note, I'm not going to be doing shoutouts to new Patreons in this episode because it's already really long, so I'll carry over all the new shoutouts to the next episode. I've wanted to cover Siam's case for a long time. In fact, it's been one of my most requested cases by listeners. What really surprised me about how many requests I got to cover Siam's case was that most of those requests weren't just from people who'd heard about the case and were touched by it, although many were. The difference in Siam's case is that the vast majority of requests came from people who knew her personally. That is actually quite rare, and it got me thinking. Every victim is special to someone, there's no doubt about that. And of course, the number of people who continue to think about you daily after your death does not in any way relate to your value as a human being. But Siam was just 20 years old when she was murdered. So I couldn't help but wonder, what was it about this 20-year-old young woman that had so many people who remembered her fondly reaching out to me? It's not like they were just thinking about her. They were going out of their way to reach out to a true crime podcaster to ask that her story be told. And that's one of the reasons I chose Siam's story as episode 100. Because I know for many of you listening, this is not just another episode, and not another case. It's personal. If you knew Siam, I urge you to think about how and when you want to listen to this episode. Please prioritize your mental health and ensure that you take breaks if you need to. In researching this episode, I used several different sources, including videos created by media houses and press articles. I'm going to be covering this case in two parts because of the length of the episodes, but both parts will be released at the same time, so you'll be able to binge listen to both. This is episode 100 of True Crime South Africa. The murder of Siam Lee. Part 1. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Carmen Nan Lee, who was the mother of Siam Lee, is alternately referred to in the media as both Carmen and Nan. In most sources, and in an interview I listened to with East Coast Radio, she's referred to as Nan, so that's how I'll refer to her in this episode. When she was a child, Nan had attended a boarding school in Peter Maritzburg called Wickham Collegiate School for Girls. She did not matriculate, however, and left school before that to travel to Asia. Nan had been a dancer in many different styles throughout her childhood, and she'd been set up with an opportunity to work in dance in Asia, so that was a very young Nan's destination. Nan would end up living in Hong Kong, but by that point she was no longer working as a dancer. At some point in her time in Asia, Nan had become involved in the sex trade, and was working as what she described as an escort. Now, sex work plays a major role in this case, so let's address this up front. People like to look down upon those who work in the sex trade, as though they are somehow above the women and men who work in this industry. Many men and women do find themselves in the sex trade because of difficulties in their lives, and would likely have chosen differently if circumstances had been different. Perhaps it's also important to define exactly what a sex worker is, 
because it's not just one thing. And I don't think most people understand the vast continuum that is the sex industry. Sex work is essentially any transaction in which someone exchanges services of a sexual or erogenous nature for money or other agreed forms of payment. The exchange of services doesn't need to be physical, though. People who work in the pornography industry, on phone sex lines, and even people with adult content only fans accounts are all technically considered sex workers. Sidebar, when people ask me what Patreon is, I often describe it as only fans without the porn. And if you don't know what only fans is, it's basically Patreon with the option of porn. When most people hear the term sex worker, they picture a reed thin woman, probably addicted to some substance, standing on a street corner because she has no other choice, and exchanging sexual acts for money. But this couldn't be further from the truth. The sex industry is the oldest on earth. It is a vast continuum of both people forced into these situations and people who choose to sell erotic photographs, for instance, because they enjoy creating them and they want a side hustle. Now, before anyone accuses me of glamorizing sex work, I am not doing that. I know sex workers. I personally know women and men who work in in different areas in this industry. For the vast majority of people, it is not something they would be doing if they had any other choice. But for many, it is something they choose, and that deserves to be acknowledged too. Not something you would do? No problem. No one's asking you to. Just listen without judgments if you can. Nan's story, and ultimately Siam's, will be intricately tied up with the side of this industry that no one ever talks about. The clients. The mostly men, and admittedly women too, who use services provided by the sex industry. Why does no one ever talk about the clients? Well, for a lot of reasons. Sex is still considered so taboo, and really, No one wants to admit that someone they know is actively promoting the sex industry, do they? No. It's much easier to pretend sex workers are providing these services that so many find so scandalous to, I don't know, Casper the Ghost? The women are doing all the so-called bad stuff, and the recipients of these services are completely invisible and free from any stigma. Seems totally fair, right? Well, in this episode, we're going to be discussing at least two clients of this industry, and they played a role in both Nan and Siam's lives. The first man is Howard Greenspan, who met Nan in Hong Kong. Howard was a businessman from Cape Town who worked in Hong Kong, and at one point he was a client of Nan's. It is not uncommon for sex workers to form long-term interactions with their clients. Most prefer to keep it superficial and as a straight business transaction. But longer-term relationships have been known to develop, and this appeared to have been the case with Nan and Howard. Now, in articles which later refer to Howard, he said to have been divorced and we have no way of knowing exactly what context his relationship with Nan fit into, and really, it doesn't actually matter. What does matter is that in 1996, Nan fell pregnant with Howard's child. It appears that there would be some form of agreement between Nan and Howard that he would financially support the child and a trust fund would be set up to pay for her education. When Siam was born on the 15th of April 1997, though, she did not take her father's surname, and instead became Siam Lee. Most of the people I spoke to for this episode also mentioned that they had never known Siam to have a relationship with her father, 
So it certainly seems that Howard took financial responsibility for the child, but did not actively participate in her life. At this point, I should probably tell you that I did attempt to make contact with Nan, but was unable to reach her. I know that she has struggled significantly since her daughter's murder, and perhaps she would not be in the best space to participate in a project of this nature anyway. So all the information I have about her and Siam's life comes from the people who knew them, interviews she gave with the media, and social media commentary that I could verify as being trustworthy. For Nan, the fact that Howard was not in her daughter's life did not appear to be a huge issue. She seemed to be doing well for herself and Siam in Hong Kong, and describes the first five years of Siam's childhood as idyllic. She says they travelled a lot, and she had a nanny that looked after Siam while she was working. Nan also says that Siam had no idea what her mother's occupation was at this young age. At some point, it seems that Nan decided that Siam would be better off starting her school career in South Africa. She'd attended a Montessori preschool in Hong Kong, but when she turned seven, she would need to officially start primary school, and this was perhaps a major factor in Nan's decision to move back to South Africa when Siam was five. Mother and daughter moved to KwaZulu-Natal in 2002, and although Nan still worked in the sex trade, she also supplemented her income by renting out rooms and a house to students. This commune-type lifestyle was definitely well-suited to the free-spirited Nan, and Siam would definitely be deeply impacted by her less-than-ordinary childhood, and not all of these impacts were negative. Siam seemed to be a really well-rounded child. She and her mother were extremely close, and Siam also took on this free-spirited nature, not really seeming too concerned about society's expectations of how she should behave. I know that many have struggled to understand the relationship between Nan and Siam, but I don't think I'm one of those people. I think I quite deeply understand it, because I've seen this exact dynamic play out in front of me in people I personally know. I've seen this deep bond between a single mother and her daughter, and how that is affected when the mother lives an alternative lifestyle to the norm and works in the sex trade. Of course, the people I know are different human beings to Siam and Nan, so it's not exactly the same. But I do think that many of the aspects would be similar. We don't know when Siam became aware that her mother worked in the sex trade. It very likely was not a single conversation that imparted this information to her. It was probably small things, mentions and leakage of information over time. At some point, though, she would have known that the secret was not to be shared outside the home. Even if Nan was not ashamed of her work, she would have very well known that others would not react positively, and if Siam's school friends knew what her mother did, she would very likely be bullied. So there's this contrast. Knowing and loving your mother and seeing her as a good human being and being grateful for the fact she provides for you. But then, there's the secret. As a child, say, under 12, you would just know it as information that the outside world wouldn't accept the same way you do. As Siam got older, though, and perhaps really began to understand what sex work actually was, she would have had a better understanding of why she had to keep that secret. But there would still be those opposing views. She is living on the inside of the secret, and she doesn't see her mother as any different from anyone else's mom. But the outside world wouldn't feel the same. She may have started to recognize when people used slurs to describe sex workers in conversation, that people like her mom 
were not viewed favorably in the vast majority of society. And who is she going to side with? Of course she's going to side with her mom. To Siam, her mom is just her mom. Whatever she does to earn money doesn't really impact her relationship with her. But as I've seen in similar relationships I've personally witnessed, this childhood secret holding and desire to protect her mother from retribution does often build an extremely strong bond. Nan actually doesn't appear to have been that different from many other single moms. She made many mistakes, she says, but she always tried to ensure that Siam was having a normal childhood. For Siam, though, even though she may not have consciously recognized it, the very fact that it was just the two of them, and there was this secret that had to be kept, meant that she would never really have been a child. She would have always felt some sort of responsibility toward her mother that perhaps didn't fit the standard mother-daughter dynamic. Siam's friends told me that she was extremely close to her mother and almost never spoke about arguing with her outside of the ordinary tiffs children and teenagers have with their parents. Their seemingly extraordinary bond would become a major factor in what later happened to Siam, though, and stood in stark contrast to what the world chose to see about their relationship. I would like to point out that, in my view at least, this intense responsibility that Siam felt toward her mother and the deep bond they had was not necessarily healthy. And I say this only because I've seen how it can play out in terms of the child taking far too much responsibility for the parent. It's a form of codependency, really, and will almost always have negative consequences for both the child and the parent. But it's also something that happens very often. While Nan was still working to provide for her and her daughter, Siam's education at least was paid for by her father, and she would go on to attend excellent schools in KZN, including Crawford International College on the North Coast for high school, where she would meet many of the friends who ultimately reached out to me. Siam soon proved that she was a gifted student. Her mother, at one point, would say that the girl's IQ had tested at 127, which is certainly considered above average. While Siam was still in primary school, though, in 2005, when she was just eight years old, the young girl experienced a significant event in her life. Her father, Howard Greenspan, was murdered. The limited reporting around the crime says that Howard, who by that time was 52 years old, divorced and living alone in a luxury apartment in Clifton, Cape Town, was found shot to death in his home. A 28-year-old female was arrested at his apartment, and the articles available seem to allude to the fact that this woman may have been a sex worker. There are no follow-up articles to this, and I cannot find any judgments in murder cases that contain Howard's name, so I cannot conclusively say whether anyone was ever found guilty of this crime. Now, as I've said, it doesn't appear that Siam really had any type of relationship with her father, but there are so many weird parallels in their deaths, which I'll discuss in more detail a little later. For now, you should know and keep in mind that Howard Greenspan was murdered on the 4th of January, 2005. After Howard's death, Nan would later say that she'd struggled for years to ensure that Siam was, quote, given her dues, as she phrased it. I don't know whether Howard had included Siam in his will or if he had other children, but the eventual results of what Nan said was a protracted battle was a trust fund that was created which would pay Siam's education costs. One would think that the terms of that agreement would have included how long the payments would continue for and whether it would cover tertiary education. 
that this would become the source of much debates later. In 2011, when Siam was 14, Nan briefly considered moving to Bloemfontein. She'd been renting out part of her house to students, and the college they attended relocated campuses, so she'd lost a huge amount of income. In her own words, she wanted to enroll her daughter in a boarding school in KZN, which she thought would offer her more structure. And then she herself would move to Bloemfontein and find a farmer. I say that with a bit of a teasing tone, because although I'm sure that there are many farmers who would have gladly welcomed the attractive blonde into their home, I somehow don't think free-spirited Nan would have lasted very long as a farmer's wife. Just a hunch I have. Thankfully, the boarding school that Nan had chosen to enroll Siam into had talked her out of the idea. They explained that boarding schools were not the same as when Nan had attended one. These days, children went home at weekends, and Siam would be very lonely if, if she had to stay at school on the weekends and couldn't see her mother for extended periods. Although Siam was very intelligent and excelled at her schoolwork, she was already quite a handful, because, like her mother, she didn't do well following the norms of society and the school was concerned she would become bored at boarding school, and a bored 14-year-old is never a good thing. Siam's friend at the high school she did end up attending, Crawford College, North Coast, soon gravitated toward the girl. And I'll read you two pieces written by two of those friends a little later in the episode, where they share their memories of Siam. Siam had grown up into a beautiful young lady. She wore her curly brown hair long and flowing, and her pale blue eyes stood out in photographs. She dressed in a way that I can only assume was uniquely Siam. She really did have a bit of a hippie vibe about her, and seemed far more concerned with being comfortable and happy than following any fashion trends or concerning herself with the male gaze. Siam had both a Facebook and Instagram account, and the photos of her on there are artistic and deep. Scrolling through them really gives you a good idea of who she was and what she stood for. It also all seems really mature. There are no goofy, silly posing pictures you might expect to see on a teenager's social media account. Siam was all depth and mood. One post reads, quote, Why should I have to alter the natural states of my body to be seen as socially acceptable? End quote. Siam was already clearly very comfortable with her body, and I think that spoke to the environment she grew up in as well. Nan had made a living out of understanding and capitalizing on her sexuality, and I don't say that in a negative way. That's just what she'd done, and how she felt about herself. And Siam had clearly grown up feeling entirely comfortable in her own skin. The photographs on her Instagram account when she was still a teenager sometimes border on erotic. And some might say it isn't something teenage girls should be doing, and perhaps they shouldn't. But for Siam... It wasn't a way of getting attention. At least, that's not how it comes across to me. She wasn't showing off or trying to portray herself as a sexual being. She was creating art, and her body was the palette. Unlike many teenage girls who may post what some consider to be questionable photos on their social media, Siam doesn't come across as saying, Here, look at these boobs I have, in a desperate plea for attention. She actually seemed to deeply understand how a woman's sexuality is so often used as a weapon against her. When she was just 18 years old, she posted the following quote, which is quite long, but I think it gives an interesting insight into this young woman, who was clearly far older in her mind than her biological years. Quote, 
Rather than fighting for every woman's right to feel beautiful, I would like to see the return of a kind of feminism that tells women and girls everywhere that maybe it's all right not to be pretty and perfectly well behaved. That maybe women who are plain or large or old or differently abled, or who simply don't give a damn what they look like because they're too busy saving the world or rearranging their sock drawer, have just as much right to take up space as anyone else. I think if we want to take care of the next generation of girls, we should reassure them that power, strength, and character are more important than beauty, and always will be. And that even if they aren't thin or pretty, they are still worthy of respect. That feeling is the birthright of men everywhere. It's about time we claimed it for ourselves. End quote. Now, Siam didn't write that. It's credited to Love is a Dirty Word blog. But it's one of the few text pieces she has on her Instagram account. And I think it's quite remarkable that a girl of her age resonated with something like that. So why am I drilling down so deep into all the facets of Siam's life? What she thought of society and feminism and what the world thought of her? Well, this is a victim-focused podcast, but there's more to it in this case. From this point in this episode, we don't have much time left with Siam. And when she's taken... She will be turned into a single-faceted representation of the type of victim South Africa and maybe the world wanted her to be. She will be described in just a few different terms, and they all refer to one small part of her life. And that is not how this young woman should be remembered. So that's why we're diving so deeply into all the bits that made up this young woman that was Siam Lee. Because I want you to know her before we lose her, like all those people who reached out to me. One of the most interesting things for me when I research cases is drawing up a timeline of both the victim's life and the offender's life in the days months and years before a violent crime incident. Because when the violent crime happens, especially if it's a relative stranger crime, we sit back and go, wow, how did that happen? It's just the sudden horrible convergence of circumstances that brought these two people onto the same path with this terrible outcome. But it isn't really. Hardly ever. When I draw up these timelines, I get to see what one person was doing when the other was doing something else, even before they knew each other. And it's interesting to me, and often quite scary, how these escalations happen, and how their paths slowly move together until they collide. So at this point, I want to do exactly that. I want to start painting a picture for you of where Siam Lee was and where a man called Pilani Tuli was. If you've even a passing knowledge of this case, you will know that Pilani Tuli was the man who would eventually be accused of Siam Lee's murder. Sebol Nkosi Gift Pilani Ntuli was a well-educated, well-spoken, successful young man in his late twenties. He was a biochemist, and his name is on several research articles related to biofuels and alternative energy sources. He didn't want to work in research, though. Pilani had aspirations to business, and had started collecting funding for a business he intended to build around biofuels. Pilani is a close relative of the MEC for Health at the time, Dr. Sibongiseni Dlomo, and owned a very nice home in Asagai, a suburb of Etikweni. 
In 2014, Pilani started a relationship with former Miss Teen South Africa runner-up, Lucky Mtembu. On a program called Unpacked, which is available on YouTube, Lucky tells the story of her relationship with Pilani. She recounts how Pilani had almost immediately become very controlling. She'd moved in with him, and that was when the physical abuse had started. Lucky says that she struggled through more than a year of emotional, financial, and physical abuse before deciding in early 2016 that she needed to leave Pilani. As is very common in domestic violence situations, when she made this decision, she found herself at the greatest risk of all. Lucky laid charges related to an assault that occurred at Pilani's home in 2016 when she broke up with him. She would also lay further charges after that, relating to Pilani's continued stalking and harassment of her. After quite a struggle, Lucky managed to obtain a protection order against Pilani, and when she did, she says he turned his rage to her family. I want to be very clear that what I am about to relay is not my opinion or something I have knowledge of. It is a repetition of what Lucky Mtembu has told several journalists and included in an 11-page report about Pilani's behavior toward her. Shortly after she obtained the protection order against Pilani Ntuli, Lucky Mtembu's mother's car was set alight in the driveway outside her home. Then, not long after, Lucky's mother was murdered while coming out of her place of work. The case was never solved, and Lucky has been very vocal about her beliefs that her ex, Pilani Ntuli, was behind both the car fire and the murder. She says after her mother was killed, there were still occasional incidents of harassment from Ntuli, but he eventually seemed satisfied he caused as much damage as he could. In May 2016, Lucky Mtembu had recovered enough strength after her ordeal with Ntuli that she decided to press forward with her action against him. She says that the charges she laid with police were never followed up, and each time she complained that he was violating the protection order, no action was taken against him. As such, the young woman took a bold step. She says that although she was now completely separated from Ntuli and could have just moved on with her life, her fear was that he would do this to someone else. And perhaps he was capable of even worse if her suspicions about his involvement in her mother's murder were true. As a result, she used the public platform she'd built through her modelling and business ventures to pen an 11-page letter to Police Minister Fikile Mbalula. She released it publicly and detailed all of the abuse she'd suffered and accused police of allowing a predator to walk the streets where he could easily harm other women. At the time, the report got some press coverage. Ntuli's government minister relative had even reached out to him and asked him to respond to the accusations being made against him, he denied it all, and no action was taken by the police against Pilani Ntuli. In fact, instead of backing off, Ntuli restarted his campaign of terrorism against Lucky by creating a website on which he essentially used so-called revenge porn to shame Lucky. Still, his actions remained unaddressed by police. While Pilani Ntuli was allegedly conducting the significantly abusive relationship with Lucky Mtembu, Siam Lee was finishing high school and coming to a sudden and rather shocking realization. Nan would say that the problems with the trust fund had already started in Siam's matric year, but she'd managed to get them to pay for her daughter's school fees until she finished school. Nan, though, and by extension her daughter, seemed to have been under the impression that the trust fund from her father would pay for her tertiary education as well. But it soon became clear that wasn't going to happen. I honestly don't know what went wrong here. 
I don't know if there was only enough money to cover primary and high school and the money ran out, or perhaps the agreement was always that Siam's education would only be funded until she turned 18. It is strange to me that there was no documentary evidence of what the actual agreement was. It would seem cruel to get Siam's hopes up that she would have a funded tertiary education if that was never guaranteed. I don't know what the actual problem was, but I do wonder if Nan, being the free-spirited and perhaps not detail-oriented person that she was, had made assumptions and not actually asked the question. She would later say that the lawyer that ran the trust fund had questions to answer as it related to what happened to Siam. Not having much detail, I can't say whether that's fair or not, but it does feel like a stretch. Siam matriculated with good results. Her mother said that her dream was to qualify as a teacher and then go back to Hong Kong to work. But when she discovered that she didn't have any funding for her education, those plans had to change. Siam began working various jobs to earn money. She waitressed, tended bar, did promotion work and modelled. Really, a very normal way for a young person to be starting their life. Nan says, though, that she watched as Siam began to fade away during this time. She says that her daughter saw all of her friends heading off to university, and she was unable to do so. Now, I can fully understand Siam, being a young person, may have seen this disappointment as quite severe. I think we can all look back at our teens and early twenties and recognise how we thought things not going to plan were huge events that impacted us so greatly. But really... Not being able to study at university is not the end of the world, and many people study by correspondence while working or just jump straight into the working world. I will acknowledge that Siam, having gone to a private school where most of her friends were likely from well-off families, would have made a difference. There probably weren't very many of her schoolmates who didn't have fixed plans for their lives after school, whether that was university, a gap year travelling, or something else equally exciting. But this wasn't anything new to Siam. She had spent her entire school life in this dichotomy of being the less privileged girl among her peers. I might be badgering on the point now, but much would be made of it later, so I want to explore it a bit here before we get there. While Siam was navigating this change of plans in her life, the man she had not yet met had become the subject of a new complaint. In 2016, a young woman who would be referred to as Kate was abducted and raped. Although the young woman had not wanted to press charges against her assailant at the time, her parents had approached a man who would later play a pivotal role in this case one Sunday morning after church. Brad Nathanson is a private investigator based in KwaZulu-Natal. He's quite well known, has worked on several high-profile cases, and knows his province and its criminal elements like the back of his hand. In 2016, Kate's parents approached him with the horrifying tale of what their daughter had experienced at the hands of an unknown man who had called himself Oscar. Due to the confidential nature of rape cases, it was never 100% confirmed whether Kate had been working in the sex trade at the time, nor does it really matter, but some sources have inferred this, and it would speak to a pattern of victim selection. Kate said that she'd been abducted by gunpoint by the man who called himself Oscar, he made her undress and lie naked behind the front and passenger seats and in front of the back seats of his Mercedes coupe before driving into his garage and closing the door behind him. He then dragged Kate from the car and straight into his kitchen via a garage and then into a bedroom. Over the next few hours, 
Kate was raped and belittled by the man. She was eventually able to convince him to let her go by promising that she wouldn't report the abduction and rape to anyone, including the police. She'd eventually told her parents what had happened, but refused point-blank to open a case at the police station. Kate's parents were concerned about this man walking the streets, though. Even if their own daughter just wanted to move on with her life, they felt that this man needed to be brought under someone's attention. Kate couldn't provide a surname for the man who'd abducted her, but she was able to tell Brad that the house she was taken from was in a road, perhaps aptly named, Controversy Road, in Assegai. Brad took Kate and they drove up and down the road. She initially identified a house she thought she'd been taken to, but considering she'd been forced to stay down between the seats, she'd only seen glimpses of the outside, and it would later emerge that the house she'd been in was actually next door to the house she initially identified. Two years later, she would be walked through the house of Pilani and Tuli, who lived on Controversy Road, and she identified it as the home she'd been brought to during her ordeal. I must reiterate, though, that Kate would never have the opportunity to prove her claims in court, and as such, we have to consider that, at least in a legal sense, Ntuli is only accused and not convicted of this crime. While Kate was recovering from her ordeal at the hands of the man she believed was Pilani and Tuli, Siam and her mother were entering a difficult period in their lives. As 2016 faded away and 2017 dawned, Siam was still working odd jobs, holding on to the hope that she would be able to make her dreams come true. She was still living with her mom, who was working as a sex worker in an establishment close to their home. In 2017, Nan and a colleague got into an argument, which soon turned heated. The two women engaged in a physical altercation, and during this fight, Nan was burned with scalding water. She sustained severe burns to large parts of her body. These injuries soon became badly infected, which extended her recovery process significantly. Nan was unable to work while she recovered, and the money that Siam was bringing in was simply not enough to cover all of their joint costs. Nan and Siam were evicted from their home after not being able to pay the rent for several months, and the owner of the establishment Nan worked at agreed to let both women move in there. It's not uncommon for establishments that facilitate sex work to allow their workers to live on the premises. Some workers will live there permanently, while others will only stay over while they're working. It's around this time that Nan says one of the other women living at the house had asked Siam why she wasn't working in the sex trade. This suggestion had seemed to spark some thought in Siam, and soon she was telling her mom that she thought it might be a good way for her to earn money. Nan says that she resisted Siam's suggestion for a long time, but her daughter was persistent, and she eventually relented with one condition. Nan wanted to be present at any bookings her daughter took. Nan also says that at no time was Siam ever providing a full sexual experience to clients. In other words, she was not having complete penetrative sex. The service Nan says that her daughter provided was essentially erotic massage. It may be easy for us to assume that Nan was simply trying to make the situation seem less seedy than it was after the fact, but there is some proof to support what Nan was saying. The women working from the sex work establishment in Durban North, where Nan and Siam worked, mostly advertised on a website called redvelvet.com. The page advertising both Nan and Siam's services was screenshotted and is still available on the internet today. 
It shows both Nan and Siam posed in erotic positions, Nan in lingerie and Siam in panties, but topless. Women in the sex trade hardly ever work under their real names, for obvious reasons, and Siam and her mother had chosen the moniker Student in Training for Siam. The story behind this moniker would lead into the idea that Nan was present for any appointment Siam had. The ad clearly details the services that Siam was prepared to offer and ends with the words, No FH available. FH stands for full house. Full house is a term used in the sex trade to describe a full penetrative sexual act between a client and a sex worker. So this ad does seem to support Nan's claim that Siam was not having intercourse with clients for money. And to be honest, that doesn't really matter to me at all. I know for some people it might make a difference, but I've never been one to judge people by how they choose to engage with their bodies. What this advert does do, though, and what it would do for many people, is place Nan Lee directly in the firing line of blame after her daughter's murder. For me, though, I see this a little differently. Many people may feel that Siam was groomed into this by her mother, and while we'll never really know whether that's true or not, the dynamic of this type of parent-child relationship I discussed earlier really comes into play here. Nan would say that Siam had been doing the essential massages to save up money to study. But I think the codependent nature of this mother and daughter's relationship probably meant that wasn't entirely true. Siam likely felt like she had to step up to help both her mother and herself. Now while for most of us, sex work seems like a last resort, Siam had grown up in a world where there were varying degrees of interactions with clients, and all of them made you far more money than a waitressing job. So, in perhaps a slightly dark way, it actually seems natural that Siam would not have felt averse to the idea of offering certain services for money. And I'm very sure she did so more to be of assistance to her mother than to save up for her studies. Nan probably never asked her to do this. But we have to remember that these two women live in a very different world to the rest of us. Another young person faced with a similar predicament might get a job at a pizza joint, because sex work simply isn't even on their radar. But in Siam's world, it was pretty normal. She'd known about her own mother's sex work for a long time, and still deeply loved and respected her. She'd become friendly with many of her mother's co-workers, and was able to see them as the human beings they were. For her, while sex work was certainly not ideal, there wasn't a brick wall between the idea and her thoughts. All possibilities coexisted in the same universe. Despite this, it soon became clear that Siam had been a little naive about the deep emotional impact this type of work can have on a person. Nan presents with a pretty tough exterior, and it's likely that Siam had never really seen the damage the work had done to her mother over the years. By September 2017, though, it became clear that Siam was not handling the work she was doing on an emotional level. After her murder, an advocacy organization that works with sex workers would come forward to tell police that Siam had reached out to them. One of the counsellors recounted that Siam had expressed that she was emotionally broken from the work she was doing and didn't know how much longer she would be able to do it. Siam reached out to this organisation regularly throughout the months that followed and sometimes donated her old clothes so that they could be distributed to other women who were struggling. In October 2017, the two paths we've been tracking so far finally crossed. 
Pilanin Tuli, booked a sensual massage with Siam Lee, and they met for the first time. And that is where I'm going to end part one of this episode. Part two is already waiting for you to listen to, and I'll see you over there.